Welcome back. Here we are in season two of Stories of Learning. I wanted to start the new year off fresh, so we're going to dive into a completely new season. The episodes are going to be a little bit longer. They're going to be a little bit more in-depth. I'm really excited to share that with you. For those of you that haven't heard any episodes yet, this is where we dive into the learning process. I have guests on and interview them and hear their opinions and thoughts and, and what their path has been like down the learning process. They share ideas and concepts and thoughts from their own experiences. And if you check out my Patreon, you'll also hear some bonus content where we get to hear a little bit of uh, a couple fun stories about something they learned along the path. My very first guest of this season is someone that I met at Victor Wooten's Center for Music and Nature. His name is Justin Fitzpatrick, or Dr. Fitz. So I went to Victor's camp um, in 2019, and, and there, it was a teaching camp, so teaching about teaching and so all these different types of teachers came and, and gave lectures about how they teach and kind of different um, approaches that they take and and dr fitz came and gave an awesome lecture um, i really really enjoyed his his subtle way of making sure that he is aware of what his students need from him and and how to gently kind of steer them on the right path to success and and it's always with him i find it's always their personal success, and I really thought that that was a great way of approaching it. But you'll hear, you'll hear all of that right from him, so I won't give too much away. I do want to say before we jump in, though, if if any of the topics that we discuss are are of interest, or if you if you have a story of your own that relates to one of them, then definitely send an email to storiesoflearning at gmail dot com. I'd love to share some of those stories on future episodes. Or if you have questions for any of the guests that I've had or the guests that I have in, in the future, then I can include those as well. And finally, if you have your own story that you want to share and you want to have an audio version of it on the podcast, then just grab your phone and make an audio memo and, and send that over to me and I'll, I'll include it at the end of a future episode. I think that would be really cool. All right, let's dive in. Thanks so much for doing this with me. Of course. Um, so usually I have three segments that I get into and then we have kind of a bonus round afterwards, which is kind of like a lightning round. Mm -hmm. Um, but before we get into any of that, I just want to do a little bit of a, an introduction and hear a little bit about who you are, what you do and, and what you're up to. Sure. So my name is Justin Fitzpatrick. Uh, I was born and raised in a town called Allentown, Pennsylvania. I lived there for the first 23 years of my life. And then I moved to Nashville, Tennessee to pursue graduate education in mathematics at Vanderbilt University. Uh, so I was there for, for five years doing my PhD in math. And then I stayed on there another year as a lecturer. So I was there six years and taught for four of the years, three as a graduate student, one as a lecturer. And then after, that year as a lecturer, which was 2011, I left Vanderbilt and went across the street to a, to a local private high school called University School of Nashville. And I have been teaching there ever since then. This is my ninth year awesome. at USN. Very cool. Very cool. And, and we met at, uh, at Victor's camp, mm -hmm. um, Victor Wooten's camp. Um, and you came in and did a lecture there. That was really, really interesting. It was a great yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, and you played some awesome piano for us. That was a great time too. <laughs> well, a little more scary. I felt a little less prepared for that. <laughs> it was awesome. That was awesome. Um, cool. So then let's dive into our first segment. So all of my segments I get from Josh Waitskin's book, The Art of Learning. Um, they're based off of his book. Uh, really, really interesting book about the learning process. And um it's his journey through the learning process as he sees it through chess and through Tai Chi Chuan later on. So just a really interesting book, and it, it kind of gave me the inspiration for this podcast. So the first segment I have is Making Smaller Circles. Often I find in, in my experience with my students when I'm teaching music, um, or in my own past experience in math, um, I find that the actual concept of what we're doing can be lost. So as an example, you learn a certain formula or we're using trigonometry or something like that, and we go through and we get the answer, 
because we follow the steps correctly, but the actual thing that we're trying to accomplish or what it really means, I find is lost a lot of the time. Um, and you're just kind of going through the motions of it. So in Josh's book, he discusses the idea of making smaller circles, which is diving in really deep into one concept until you really kind of know it inside and out um, before you move on to the next one. So, so how do you see that in the world of math and how do you kind of address it? Yeah, well, it's very much there. And, and, and uh, I talked to my students a lot about the idea that it's very easy to find a math education, certainly in the United States and probably in Canada as well, where uh, it's very mechanical and very rote. And, you know, usually it becomes pretty, uh, pretty boring. And that causes people to, to lose interest. And when they lose interest, they, they don't learn as well. Uh, and I try to do, you know, I try to always present the big picture ideas and probably, and I see, and when you do that, you see why people do it the other way, because, because there's a certain zero sum nature to it, to some degree. Uh, you know, uh, I would say that the students I teach are not as good on average, some of them are fantastic, but but on average, probably not as good at the purely mechanical calculations as some kids are from other schools. What I say to my kids all the time is, uh, I could turn you into a really terrible computer. That like sure. that would be one way that I could educate you. Here's the formula that we're gonna learn today. Here's a worksheet where you apply the formula 25 times. And then here's a homework worksheet where you apply it another 25 times yeah. and I'll see you tomorrow. You know, yeah. that, that education exists many places. Uh, but, but I would never want to, I would never want to be educated in such a way. And I would never want to provide an education like that. Yeah. So, so uh, I present ideas a lot of the time and I present when I give them problems to do, which I think is very important. Problem solving is such a huge part of mental growth. Um, I, I, I give pretty few, pretty few of the just purely mechanical ones, but lots of questions where I approach ideas from lots of different angles. Mm -hmm. So that way uh, you can always see, or you, you, can, you can better figure out if a student really has an understanding of what's going on and can do something apart from just the most basic thing, uh, apart from just following steps. And a lot of times the, the, the best ideas for questions come from when I ask questions to students just verbally and they say something that's uh, not quite right. You tell they have some intuition for what's going on, but, uh, but you also can tell that their understanding isn't, isn't just right, isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if I'm being clever in that moment, you know, I can think about some question to ask them to see if uh, they actually understand the thing that I suspect they misunderstand. Mm -hmm. and so by giving them a big variety of questions, and then, you know, if that question works well, then I'll keep it and I'll make it a question that I give to everybody in the future. You know? yeah. um, and so by giving them this bigger variety of questions, they kind of appreciate it because they kind of feel more engaged. They're, uh, they're not just doing the same thing over and over again. They're trying to uh, reorient their brain all the time in a yeah. good way. Yeah. Although some kids find it uh, a little uncomfortable. You know, some of them like the comfort of doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. But, uh, but, as a teacher, you, you have to embrace a certain unpopularity sometimes. You <laughs> yeah. have to try to do what you think is best for them, even if they don't like it in the moment. Mm. So do you think that you spend most of your time trying to figure out what angle you can go at and, and kind of how they're taking it in? On an individual level, for sure. For mm. sure. And that's one of the nice things about teaching at a school where my, my classes are smaller is that I can do more individual work and I get to do more individual work. Mm -hmm. When you have a, a larger group, then it's more difficult. You know, yeah. 
I, I try to, I, I still am doing it the same way. Like I'm giving them lots of different types of questions. I just don't always know that they're the best questions for each person. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And to wrap this section up, how was it, how was it for you when you were learning um, math? Was it, did you go about it in that kind of computerized way or were you hooked on the creative aspect of it? I would say, uh, so I, I went to public school myself years ago and uh, I had a great education and uh, the type of education I had was probably, uh, it was far more mechanical, but I was lucky enough to have teachers where they would ask you questions that were a little outside the box on occasion. And, and I just, I just loved it. I loved math uh, from a, from a very young age. And I liked being a little bit uncomfortable with it. I liked being in a position where I didn't see the solution and I liked trying things even if they didn't work. And I was uh, usually in tune enough with what was going on to see if I tried something and it didn't work, what, what made it not work and, and what would be my workaround. Hmm. And, and that process was something that I really enjoyed. Yeah. Not everybody enjoys that. Some people, if some people want everything they try to work, uh, first time. Yeah, I get that. Everybody yeah. likes success, but, um, but of course, you know, it's it's a uh, what everybody talks about delayed gratification, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I enjoyed the delayed gratification of not getting it right the first time around, but then, you know, persisting with it and having success later on. Is there a way that you try and show your students kind of the the difference, I guess, between instant gratification and delayed gratification? Well, I definitely, um, I, I constantly present them with problems that I know they're going to struggle with. And uh, early on in the year, for a lot of students, it's their first experience with that. My class yeah. is their first experience with that. So they are frustrated, can be frustrated a little bit at first, but, and some, some of them, you know, it takes months. Some of them, it takes a matter of months before they get over that hump. Some of them get over the hump much more quickly. And, and what, what I like to do is what I like to call positive call outs. So if I have, you know, somebody who made a couple C's on the first two tests or whatever, and then they make an A on the next one, cause they kind of have figured out what they need to do. Yeah. I'll say, hey, here's a good example of somebody who is doing extra practice or, you know, has really stuck with it. And now they're doing uh, great things. And if you're somebody who's struggling, you know, this is something that can happen for you. That's nice. Well, that kind of leads into our second section, which is uh, the downward spiral. So in Josh's book, he describes a scene that he witnessed in New York City. Um, a woman with her headphones on looks the wrong way down a one-way street. And uh, he says, and I'll quote him here, Immediately as she stepped forward looking right, a bicycle bore down on her from the left. The biker lurched away at the last second and gave her a solid but harmless bump. In my memory, time stops here. This was the critical moment in the woman's life. She could have walked away unscathed if she had just stepped back onto the pavement. But instead, she turned and cursed the bicyclist. I can see her now with her back to the traffic on 33rd and Broadway, screaming at the now distant biker who had just performed a miracle to avoid smashing into her. A taxi cab was the next to speed around the corner. Mm -hmm. So this section of Josh's book is what he calls the downward spiral. So he kind of illustrates it by imagining two lines of, of time. The one where he is and the one where the woman is, which is stuck in the past with the biker. Um, so because of her anger at being kind of taken out of her moment with her headphones on and her music, um, she gets stuck in the past and isn't able to see um, what's going to happen next, basically. Mm -hmm. So how does how do you view emotion in 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 your role uh, as teaching your students and them learning? How do you, if that is a hurdle and you can see that it's a hurdle, how can you address it? It can be a hurdle. 
but uh, but in general, I think it's just something that needs to be positively oriented. You know, uh, I have a lot of students who who, like I said, their first uh, encounter with what they perceive as failure, which for some of them is you know an eighty five. Yeah. But uh, but <clears throat> their first encounter with what they perceive as failure is in my class, and and there's some emotion that surrounds that. You know, they, they start to say things like, I always used to be good at math, but maybe I'm not good at math anymore. And I have very quickly to, uh, to correct them from saying things like that. You know, that's, that does lead to what you called a, a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. But where that's coming from, where I think that's coming from, the emotion of it is like, they want to continue to do well. They want to continue to be high achieving. And they're just at a point now where they have to start to to do a little more to make that happen you know, a lot of times i think i've heard this so many times and maybe you as a music teacher have has some of this also but uh but whenever i meet somebody for the first time and they and i they find out that i'm a math teacher i always get the same story and the same story is uh i was really good at math when i was in school until i entered 10th grade or whatever the grade was and I had this teacher and this teacher made me feel like I couldn't do it and I never succeeded again after that you know what I mean yeah definitely. I hear that story all the time and uh and of, and of course it's a great cautionary tale as a teacher you never want to be that teacher yeah you never want to be the teacher who makes somebody feel like they can't do it but also I consider it a dereliction of duty uh to to just sort of push just just present kids with the minimum material so that they know the basics and not try to push them a little bit to get better, to get better as problem solving. Problem solving is really the fruit of a mathematics education that, that everyone can enjoy, that everyone can really benefit most from. A lot of times people say, um, when am I gonna use this in my daily life? When am I gonna use the quadratic formula in my daily life, et cetera, yeah. you know? And you can yeah. say that about anything. You can say that yeah. about anything you learn. Yeah. But, uh, and so I don't begrudge them the question, but it's not the point, I always tell them. It's not the point. Uh, yeah. some, some of you will use it, most of you probably won't. But the point is that what you are gonna encounter in life is you're gonna be thinking about situations that you haven't been in before, and you have some partial information about what you're supposed to do, but you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And then you gotta take that partial information that you have and put it together and, and make a good decision out of it. Mm -hmm. That's what solving a math problem is like. You take your partial information, you try to do something positive with it. Yeah. But let me come back to what you said about emotion. So, so yeah. uh, I, what I view as a positive about the emotion associated with the whole thing is that they, it, it's coming from a place that they want to do well. Mm -hmm. And so um, I also want for them to do well. When they do well, it means they're learning well. And when they're learning well, that's, you know, the ultimate, I don't know about the ultimate, but that's a big objective. Yeah. So I just tell them, first of all, you're still extremely capable of doing everything that we're going to be covering in class this year and beyond that you just have reached a point where now your approach has to change a little bit okay and uh here's what i'm willing to do to try to help you out on this path why don't you come in after school for example why don't you come in after school you know twice a week we'll just do 15 minutes of problems together at the board i'll give you some problems to think about you can work on them and i'll give you yeah. some feedback Mm -hmm. uh, or things like that. <clears throat> yeah, That's usually my first go-to. Usually that does it actually. Yeah. They just come in and they do a little bit of extra practice. Um, with me, that usually is not, um, not more than what they need to, to jump, to make a jump to the next level. Mm. So I guess I'm just trying to channel that emotion, right? The yeah. emotion is coming from, they want to do well and they're not doing as well as they would like. And so that usually comes, that usually means they're willing to do more. Yeah. And, but they don't really know what to do. They feel yeah. like they're doing a lot, but, but, uh, but they're not always doing things that are positively productive. Yeah. So, so I kind of have a lot of years of experience more. I'm not all smarter than the kids are. I just have more experience than they have. Yeah. 
I usually know what sort of things have worked for most people in the past and what I suspect is going to work for the person in question. Yeah. And then like, if I can get their emotion oriented that way towards uh, using their time better, not yeah. necessarily more time, but just using their time better. Yeah. Uh, then that usually does the job. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. That kind of, the first two segments definitely are, we've, we've kind of touched on what the third segment is. Um, so I want to dive into that now. It's called Two Approaches to Learning. So in Josh's book, he describes at the beginning uh, two different types of learners, incremental learners and entity learners. Um, so he explains that Entity learners are people that say things like, I'm smart at this, um, like I'm smart at math or I'm smart at science, um, whereas incremental learners say things like, I did well because I worked hard at it. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, and he actually gives the example of, of a study that was given um, where they gave students easy math questions that they all solved correctly, and then they were given hard questions uh, that were too difficult for any of them to, to solve, either the incremental or the, the entity learners. Um, and through that, you, he, they, they kind of saw that the incremental learners were excited by the challenge, whereas the entity learners were kind of discouraged and wanted to turn away completely from it. Mm -hmm. So how do you see these two types of learners in your, in your classroom, and, and how do you kind of approach trying to get people to be more incremental learners um, and see that if they work hard, then they can, they can accomplish it. Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing, the first thing to do is just put that idea out there because in mm. math in particular, people seem not to have that idea. Uh, people have the idea, particularly kids have the idea that uh, you're born good at math or you're not born good at math mm -hmm. and wherever you are, that's, that's where you're going to be. And, uh, and putting myself out there as an example, I think helps because I have a PhD in math. And then uh, just, just the fact that I have those three little letters at the end of my name, uh, people assume I'm some sort of mathematical genius and I, I know better. I know mm. that I am not, uh, but yeah. I worked at it for a very long time. Yeah. And so, you know, I always tell the kids sort of like I was telling you, everybody reaches the point in their mathematical education, whether it's in fourth grade or, or graduate school or 10th grade, where they have to uh, do more than just attend class and listen to learn everything that they need to learn. They need to do a little bit more on their own. Mm -hmm. And I always say that for me, it was 10th grade. And they're like, what? For you, it was 10th grade? <laughs> Are you sure that that ever happened to you? And for sure, <laughs> but they, you know, they, they're kind of disinclined to believe it at first. But it's the truth. When I was in 10th grade, I had to start studying math. I couldn't just do it. Yeah. Um, and then what I found was when I started to study it, I started picking, I, first of all, I liked studying it and I started picking it up much more quickly. And I kind of got back to a place where things came more easily to me because I understood what I needed to do to learn things. I kind of learned about how I learn. Mm. But anyway, you know, uh, that's what I present to them. And some kids buy into that right away. That's the whole part of teaching anything to a large group is some people understand what you try to tell them, whether it's content or whether it's what I would loosely call wisdom. It's a bit of a stretch to say that what I mm -hmm. give to the children is wisdom. But anyway, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, some of them understand what you're trying to tell them right away. Yeah. And some of them do not. So, but some of them hear what you say, even if they don't understand it. In fact, maybe even all of them, they hear what you say, even if they don't understand it. And they just make, they file it. They, they yeah. file it away mentally. And then sometimes years down the road, they remember it, it or, or, or something happens to them where they realize the truth of it via some other avenue than one that was in my mind. Yeah. And, and like I said earlier, talking about uh, pointing to the example of other people around them in the classroom who are incremental learners and who are having big success, you know, and, and to me, success is not 95 successes is, is 
uh, improvement. Yeah. Many kids, like I said earlier, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but like they get off to a really tough start and mm. some of them never overcome it, but uh, many of them do. Many of them mm. figure out what it takes. And just to continue to point out those examples that everyone around you, the, the people around you who you perceive as average, they do, they do these things. They, they learn incrementally and they reap large benefits as a result. You also, whether you view yourself as gifted or not, either way, you can be an incremental learner and you can be better at this subject or literally every subject, to use the term mm -hmm. subject loosely, by taking this sort of approach. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I try to show that to my, to my music students as well that, you know, <clears throat> it, I basically try to tell them that there's so many people that can play in the world that you can easily be one of those people. Yeah. You just have to work your way up to it. And that's just the difference. I always tell them that the difference between me pl playing a song and them playing a song is that I've just put more time into it. Right. And so they just have to put some time into it. And some people will get there faster than others, but it doesn't really matter. It's just their amount of time until they get to the finish line yeah and i think yeah. that in music even things like be the the beauty and the subtlety of a performance that's not innate either i don't think i think that mm. comes from hours of practice mm. i would hope you know we all have this sort of romantic vision and i'm no exception that like maybe there's some musician somewhere <coughs> who just naturally <laughs> plays beautifully you know, who naturally, that's just within them. But yeah. uh, for me, anytime, I, I definitely find that my own performances as a quasi musician mm -hmm. uh, improve through practice in all aspects. Yeah. 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 You, you have to have the experience of playing and practicing to, to be able to have those subtleties, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I, I, you know, for, for better or for worse, I think it's for better. I, I'll show my students some, you know, for lack of a better word, prodigy, um, on YouTube that's young and can, can play some really technical stuff, mm -hmm. um, like on guitar or piano. And a lot of the time I try to show them that this is somebody that's just dedicated a lot of time to their instrument and has become technically proficient at it. Right because they put a lot of time into it, not because they were, you know, if anything, the, the, the gift or the, the, the prodigy aspect of it is their ability to focus on it and, mm, yeah. and put the time in. And uh, some people come to that easier than others. Um, but I think that all the roads lead the same way anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a tricky question that I have thought about a lot, kind of a philosophical question, I guess. It, almost the question of free will is like, to what degree is the, is the gift of being able to work hard truly an innate gift or how much is it a matter of human choice? Hmm. I, don't know, uh, I don't know how much what people traditionally call a work ethic is, uh, is, is just a gift. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I think it, whether I, I think whatever the answer to the question is, it's better to think of it as as a matter of human choice because yeah. then that's more empowering. It doesn't do you nearly as much good to think the other way. I, agreed. Yeah. That's how I think. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Well, then that's the end of my my three segments. But we do have the the quick lightning round that we can jump into. Okay. So this one is questions to make questions. So it's, it's for you to answer, but for everyone to kind of think of what their answer would be as well. Sure. So the first one is, what is your life's intention? I would say the most important thing to me in my life is to make the lives of the children I encounter better, hmm. um, however I can. Very nice. The second one is, 
Where is your life's attention to make that happen? The thing that I've learned over time is the best way for me to become a better teacher is for me to become a better man. And so uh, I'm very just reflective by nature and I spend time thinking about what are the, what are the, the aspects of myself that I feel like I need to work on. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I get to work on them um, with varying degrees of success as we, as we all do, I'm sure. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm, you know, I would say, thankfully that I'm a better person today than I was say 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I know that I'm a better teacher for it. And I know also that there's a long way for me to go as far as becoming a better person. And, and as that, as, as I make progress toward that objective, which I hopefully will, that's going to give me better results as somebody who impacts the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. So then the last one is what do you know for sure? Uh, to come back to something that we talked about earlier, it's that the, the process of incremental learning works. The process of putting in hours to, to try to figure something out, that works. I would, lo I would love for it to be true. I, I've talked about this with my students and with my colleagues as well. I would love for it to be true, <clears throat> excuse me, that there was some better method of learning than just repetition. Um, you know, as somebody who, who plays the piano, I know, like, I don't have a particularly clever way to learn a piece of music. I just put in my hundred repetitions, you know, yeah. and then, then I, I start to have it figured out. Maybe there's some more intelligent way to learn things that I don't know. I don't know that that doesn't exist, but what I do know is the old fashioned way, the, the way of um, having an expert along your side, doing repetitions, that does work mm -hmm. if you're willing to see it through. Yeah, I think that last part's very important too. If you're willing to, uh, if you're willing to see it through. One of, one of the things that, that Victor says in his book actually is we accomplish everything that we put our minds to and the only things that we don't, the only reason we fail at something is, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, but the only reason that we fail at something is because eventually we stop trying. Yeah. And that's the only thing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Love that book. That was a great yeah. book. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'll definitely post a, a, a link in the, in the show notes for Victor's book as well for people to read. Um, but very cool. That's, that's all I got then. Well, thank you for having me. This was yeah. a uh, great time. Yeah, thanks so much for being on. All right, appreciate it. All right, thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, that wraps it up for our first episode back of Season 2 of Stories of Learning. Thanks so much for listening. And um, like I said, send an email to storiesoflearning at gmail.com if you want to share your thoughts on anything that we discussed. I have quite a few interviews lined up, and I can't wait to share them all with you. If you have any questions for me or, or for Dr. Fitz, then definitely send those as well. We'd love to hear from the listeners. All right, we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.